Dee. Welcome to the Upful Life Podcast. I'm your host, B. Getz. This is episode number 20, coming at you live and direct from the Vibe Junkie Studios out here in Oakland, California. 20. You heard it. It's a proud day up in here. It's good to be here tonight. I'm sorry we're so, so late. We're not good at Japanese time, but we're very good at Nigerian time. I promise we won't do it again. Sweet as cherry pie. start off episode number 20 and that is with my white whale the one artist that I could say that I want to see most that I've never seen perform and that's Miss Sade and uh, you're hearing her soundboard recording in 1986 Tokyo and yeah this is a really strong powerful feminine energy episode of the Up for Life podcast and I really could not think of any finer or more royal way to kick things off than this amazing empress. So hopefully the concert gods will hear me out and she'll get inspired to do one final hurrah world tour. Still kicking myself, I missed her at MSG back in the early 2000s, last time she did a real world tour. Taunts me in my sleep. But nonetheless, uh, I'm going to take a minute at the beginning of every episode to thank somebody essential or organization or person or people. So uh, ideally what I'm trying to do with this slot is open it up for official sponsors so if you're a brand owner or organizational person you want to be in this slot on a weekly basis I can tell the world about whatever it is you do or provide let's talk Uh, but in the meantime I'm just going to keep shouting out people that make a difference and uh, in the spirit of what this episode is going to unveil I'm going to go with uh, the woman in my own life the amazing Alicia Ferris my partner and fiance and Oftentimes, my confidant and lately uh, caretaker. Now she not only is she a new, uh, holistic nutritionist, has her own thing called Path to Panacea, but uh, your boy went down with some oral surgery, hardcore, and uh, my queen stepped up in a major way. And part of the reason I'm even getting this episode out is because of the great care how she just made sure that everything was all right for me while I went through this experience. And I know lots of people have had this kind of stuff done, but it's never easy, and uh, especially for me, for a variety of reasons. Nonetheless, I want to say thank you to Alicia. Not only did she get me the equipment for my 40th birthday, the Zoom H5 recorder that you're hearing me transmit this podcast to you, but she... Uh, you know, it's really been a motivational force for me with this show and encouraging and I can bat uh, ideas off of her and, and she helps facilitate things in so many ways, not the least of which uh, keeping me healthy and positive and happy and inspired. And uh, 
I can say unequivocally that there would not be this show without her. I, I, I wouldn't. I might be able to do a show, but it wouldn't be this show. So, um, yeah, just wanted to take a moment and thank her. As I always thank somebody or some some organization or whatever. Um, I just thought this time I'd get personal because I uh, really saw an amazing side of her uh, that I already knew existed, but to, you know the way she stepped up for me in my time of need and made sure that uh, everything was all good. So, uh, shout out to Alicia Ferris. Check out Path to Panacea, which is uh, you know it's kind of her version of Up for Life, and I'm. She's been so encouraging to me uh, to, to take this to the next level and take what I do to another level. And I'm going to turn it back on her. So I'm going to put her on blast and let everyone who listens to the show know that she has her own thing. Um, and it's, her thing is a big part of my thing. And, and that's why I'm able to bring it to you. So if you like, if you're picking up what I'm putting down, check out Path to Panacea. Um, you can find her on Facebook. And she often shares articles and philosophical things and nutritional things and just the tip of the iceberg, but it's going to be something special. So with that, um, let's get into episode 20 of the Up For Life podcast. Actually playing the fish from Vermont on the show. Holy Alpine 3. Just uh, taking a moment to sink into the crazy 38 minute ruby waves. And uh, you know, we have, other than when JA makes an appearance, and I've been, trust, I've heard y'all, and I'm trying to get JA on the phone um, to talk fish and more. But, uh, yeah, you know, really astonishing second half of summer tour, and you know, I haven't forgotten about fish or you know the culture, and we'll try to get Jay on to talk about it soon. But in the meantime, I just wanted to take a moment and play the second half of the Ruby Waves Jam underneath the opening segment here, because I can, and because it's that fucking good. And uh, yeah, just. Uh, so much has happened in the three weeks since I last had an episode, so let me take a first opportunity to let you know it's going to be every third week episodes of the Up For Life podcast. I really intend to do them bi-weekly, but uh, one dome closed, and uh, I no longer have a day-to-day job, which means I'm taking on a considerable amount of freelance work, which is great, but cuts into my time to create the podcast and limits my ability to go as many places as I'd hope to to get interviews. So I uh, hope you guys can hang in there with me for a bit while I'm able to kind of iron out the every three weeks thing and keep the content strong and then we'll, we'll shift back to the bi-weekly uh, as soon as possible and efficient and effective. Uh, in the meantime, uh, since we last spoke over those last three weeks, not only did I have that surgery and recuperation and so forth but uh we had high sierra again uh always fantastic uh event it's kind of been a mellow version of itself for the past few years but that's not necessarily a bad thing and uh went up there for three days caught some great tunes good vibes um highlights basically jen hartswick and company took it was like a jha takeover high sierra this year I mean, she played with a bunch of groups, including her own, which was m- mixed up with members of the Nth Power, of course, her trusty sidekick, Natalie Cressman. Um, Jen was a revelation, which is not a shocker, because Jen is Jen, and we hope to have Jen Hartswick on the show one of these days. 
I let her know. I put out the bat call. I kind of, hey, Jen, come on. But, you know, she was literally like no free time whatsoever during High Sierra. So that was not going to happen. But what did happen was just an incredible string of performances from Jen, uh, especially uh, when she led her own band with Nick Casarino and Nikki Glaspie, uh, Rob Marsher, just really fantastic so that was probably some of my favorite performances of high sierra both of jen's as well as the nth power uh, marvin gay set which i spoke about at length on this show a few episodes ago and played you a bunch of and uh, you can hear the whole set from uh from jazz fest of marvin gay on the vibe junkie radio for up for life on mixcloud um but that said uh they reprised it with a slightly different lineup, and it was awesome. As awesome and as emotionally stirring and exhilarating as uh, it was in New Orleans. And as a matter of fact, bassist Nate, Nate Edgar even said he felt they dug into the material a little bit harder at High Sierra. Uh, there were some sound issues early in the set, but they got them ironed out pretty quick. And yeah, powerful stuff. And, and Casarino is about the only dude on earth who can still make a on stage cigarette look cool and sexy. You know, he just, he, the dude's mojo is out of this world. And I'm proud to uh, let y'all know that I actually did get Nicky Cake, Nick Casarino, to come on for an interview. So uh, one of the next couple of episodes of this show will include an interview with both Casarino and Nicky Glaspie shorter interviews than I intended to have because of the aforementioned time constraints of the festival. But all that stated, uh, we did scratch the surface and talk some Marvin and other stuff. I had a separate interview with Nick and Nikki. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to present them together or separate. doesn't matter. At this point, I'm just stoked that I got them to sit down, and they seemed like they would be inclined to do the long-form, career-spanning, uh, normal episode that I like to uh, provide for guests of their stature. So, High Sierra for me was, like I said, the j Ha takeover with the Nth Power Cats, and also amazing Stanton and Skerrick thing they do with Robert Walter, which was out of this world in the vaudeville tent. Star Kitchen. Star Kitchen was solid. Played two sets, including a really well-received set on the Big Meadow stage where they encored with an instrumental version of Belle Biv DeVoe Poison, which... Uh, Frankly, I've been asking and begging and praying for Lettuce to play for some time now because it's so good. Um, I don't care what anyone says. You have to acknowledge that BBD Poison is ill and stands the test of time. So, uh, yeah, those dudes busted it out. Their drummer, Marlon, is a bad motherfucker. Star Kitchen's drummer. And, of course, they got Danny Mayer. And they've got Rob Marsher again. He was all over the festival, Rob on the keys. And then Jen and Natalie and Skerrick came out and played. And uh, had some other guests. And Mark Brownstein from the Biscuits. The Star, Wh- Star Kitchen is his baby. And uh, yeah, it's just a pretty awesome thing to, to behold. So it's kind of my report from High Sierra. Uh, didn't write an article about it. But uh, other things of note, I guess, that I would acknowledge is that I saw Wolfpack for the first time proper uh, at the Greek theater here in Berkeley earlier this week. Uh, But that was cool, you know. Um, Also went and uh, didn't see, but watched on uh, the tube, the couch tour, as the kids say, uh, the bowl live with Ivan Neville and uh, the next night with O'Teal and the next night with Sko. of the three, the standout performance, I thought, was Ivan Neville of Dumpster Funk uh, stepping up with Soul Live and on the first night and doing Heart Shaped Box, um, Nirvana's classic song. and Traditional arrangement, but just with those cats playing it, with Neil Evans, I mean, Kraz, Al, plus Ivan. It was just really, really moving stuff, so... I just had to take a moment and, and shout that out and just kind of say, if you have the opportunity to, to find that on YouTube, uh, the whole show is up and then you got to go two hours into the, the link and you'll find that Nirvana cover with Ivan. And then uh, Jamiroquai, you know, 
It's a big Jamiroquai house. And Jamiroquai busted out the horn section for the first time in years for one gig on Blackheath Festival in uh, England, where they're from, in London area. And uh, they debuted You Are My Love, which some of you might be scratching your head and be like, and that is? That's a deep cut, beloved song in the Jamiroquai community, the Jamily, as they say. Um, a song that uh, has never been played before and has an amazing horn line and horn part. And uh, yeah, I guess is a gift to the hometowners. Jay brought back the horns for one night and they busted out You Are My Love. So you can find that on YouTube as well. So that's basically my, like, uh, around the horn, if you will. Uh, other one, otherwise, want to mention that Ghost Note is performing with the Vanguard vocalists, the dudes that, uh, the backup vocalists from D'Angelo's band, at the Beloved Festival in August in Tidewater, Oregon. If you find yourself in that region of the country, you should probably go to Beloved anyway. It's a really heady fest. People swear by it, especially up in Nevada City where I used to live. But uh, Ghost Note and the Vanguard, I mean, if you don't know, you better ask somebody because that's going to be some shit. And, uh, of course, there'll be great electronic and world house and really cool uh, indigenous music at Beloved as well. So, yeah. Before this Ruby Waves Jam really kicks back into overdrive, I'm going to uh, dip and we're going to seg into the introduction of our first guest on the Up For Life podcast, episode 20, Miss Anna Moss from Handmade Moments. So give me a moment and I'm going to queue up some Handmade Moments and we'll get into the featured guest. <laughs> So, episode 20's featured guest is Miss Anna Moss from Handmade Moments. Now, uh, go way back kind of with Anna here as we talk about it in the interview. And uh, the short version is that I was introduced to her outside of an ecstatic dance in Nevada City, California in um, spring, summer 2014. My friend Kimmy Creation, uh, amazing artist, jeweler, and my dear friend uh, kind of put Anna and Handmade Moments on my radar. But it wasn't until a year and a half later um, when I was uh, working for uh, Jumpsuit Records in a capacity of just kind of uh, new releases, something I still do from time to time for them, where I'll write stuff up. Uh, Polish, uh, Polish ambassador who runs the label, slid uh, this one on my desk, uh, Handmade Moments Paw Paw Tree, which you're hearing Coffee Chocolate Earth off of in the background. And, uh, yeah, so that kind of was out of left field for me, and I was put two and two together, and, oh, that was that girl that Kimmy introduced me to, and, and it is Anna and her partner Joel, and uh, there are this really quirky, fun, funky... Uh, awesome duo so unique and uh i've just been a fan ever since kind of taking on that project and it was like out of my comfort zone but uh it quickly became a comfortable zone and uh sort of just been paying attention ever since and uh they came through here uh berkeley botanical garden last week and uh two weeks ago i guess should say and we had opportunity to chop it up and talk about their amazing story, which is full of inspiration and overcoming adversity and just amazing, amazing, inspiring, beautiful story. And uh, their story is so special that um, it was imperative for me to get Anna to come tell it. Um, 
Their music is full of really rich and powerful messages, a human sort of element, yet there's like a lot of politics behind it. And it's also really funny and it's accessible. And they have,、uh, as a duo, performing this just intangible chemistry that is,、uh, it is just it, intoxicating. And、uh, I was really honored when they came and asked me to write their bio for their press kit and their website. Like, they thought that I could be the one to tell people about what they do. And that's a really powerful thing. Task and something that I am humbled by and honored to be asked, and、uh, and I do it for a few artists, and it never take it anything less than serious as a heart attack. But、um, for this, they're really popular. Handmade moments are really blowing up, and they're getting a lot of attention. And for them to put that into my hands may seem somewhat insignificant, but it really meant a lot. And at that moment, I said, you know, one day I'm going to interview them or her.、Um, And they came to the Berkeley Botanical Gardens last week, and I did. We did it about 15 minutes before the show, and then she went and joined up with Joel, and they put on a, just a thrilling hour long concert in this redwood grove, breathtaking environs. And then we went for a walk out into the redwoods and finished the interview about 20 minutes. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play the first portion, and then I'm going to play an awesome song from them. In the slot in between, and then Anna and I will come back and finish up. The whole interview is like 35 ish minutes, and then、uh, we'll move on to guest number two. But not before we finish up a little Eye in the Sky here from Handmade Moments. This is the Up for Life podcast. I'm your host, B. Getz, and Anna Moss from Handmade Moments is coming right up. Everybody seems to know what they're coming here for. They seem to know what they're after. Know what they're after. Chicken pie pie. That ain't working in such time. So I gotta. And we're live here at the.、Uh, Berkeley Botanical Gardens on the University of California at Berkeley campus. And I'm here with Anna Moss from Handmade Moments. So thank you, Anna, for taking a few minutes to hang out and chat before your gig here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm, I'm stoked that we get to do this. And,、uh, you know, we have a sort of、uh, friendship and professional relationship for some time. And I've always been really like, fond of what you guys are doing and the, the way that this materialized right here where I live. Or across, you know, across the way in Oakland, and that you had time, it really felt like cosmic. Yeah. So、uh, I wanted to first just talk a little bit about our surroundings. We're in this natural botanical gardens amphitheater, really beautiful place to play a show. Mm hmm. Yeah, do you do a lot of these kind of gigs, these sort of、uh, public, not, not your normal tour, but you know, these sort of summertime gigs? We're starting to. This is such a beautiful setting. There's redwood trees all around us. And I hear Joel playing his tuba and seeing him down there <laughs> in between some trees.、Um, we started doing more of this type of thing this year. I told, we,、uh, we went on a big tour last year after we released Paw Paw Tree. Right. And it was so many shows that we played. We toured for 10 straight months in the United States and then Europe.、Um, and after that, we told our new booking agent this year we want to play more. Outdoor shows,、um, not at bars. not And if we play at a venue, I want the bar to be in a different room than the music. And、um, we want to play free shows too. This show's not free, but we are playing a lot of free outdoor shows this year. And I'm very excited about that. Right on, yeah, those are the best kind. you know、yeah. for, Lots of people can come of all different ages, and they're not necessarily your target demo, so it introduces you to new artists, or excuse me, new fans、yeah. that otherwise wouldn't know handmade moments. Exactly. Now, I met, remember when I met you、uh, first, it was outside of Ecstatic Dance in Nevada City. Kimmy introduced us.、Oh, yeah. It was long before Paw Paw Tree and even before, you know,、uh, just maybe around 2014. Okay. So,、oh. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy to think about that. And we've had some interactions in the ensuing half decade. But I want to take it back a little further than that. Even though I think of you as California, you're actually from the Ozarks.、Mm-hmm. Um, just for the people that don't know, maybe paint a little bit of a picture of. 
of the uh, embryonic stage of Handmade Moments, how you guys came together, who's involved then and now, and uh, yeah. how the music is native to that region. Well, I'm from the Eureka Springs area of Arkansas, which is up in the Ozark Mountains, super beautiful, um, modest mountains, big hills. It's a big hill type of vibe. And Joel's from the central part of the state in Conway, and we met in college at a party. A, a mutual friend named Jessica had been telling us about each other for months, and finally we ended up at the same party on the same night at his band house. Joel's in a rock and roll band at the time called Don't Stop Please. And I was at the party, and he walks in with a guitar on him like he always does because he was always walking around playing guitar back then and um my friend was there and she said Anna and Joel you got to meet finally and so Joel had heard about me so before we even said anything to each other he started playing something and I started singing with it I did like a scat thing and it was a super cool moment um and then I reached out my hand and I was like hey I'm Anna and he kissed my hand which was controversial because my boyfriend at the time <laughs> hated that <laughs> I bet. and didn't speak to me for the rest of the night uh. cold shoulder <laughs> but we were just friends and we um I ended up joining his rock and roll band a couple years later I guess we met 10 years ago and then I joined Don't Stop Please eight years ago and then Handmade Moments formed as a side project to make some extra cash and we just played jazz back in the day old timey jazz songs right on so you guys you actually put out a record with don't stop please right i put out a record and an ep mm -hmm. and this is 2008 2009 2010 around then 2000 and oh goodness <laughs> oh, just trying to get a frame of reference it's 2011 okay. 2012 maybe Right on. And then, uh, so Handmade Moments sort of materializes as a side project, and you're playing old-timey jazz. Uh, is that to, like, college-age audiences or just sort of jazz houses? What, where were you gigging like that in the early days? We were in college, but we were mostly playing at fancy bars um, in Little Rock, in Conway, in fancier restaurants. So we'd dress up <laughs> and play old jazz songs at fancy spots. And, yeah, it was fun. I bet. What was the instrumentation back in those days? Joel played guitar. I played alto saxophone and ukulele, and we both sang. Right on. And uh, you cut a record in those days as well, right? You had, this is your third record, Paw Paw Tree, right? Mm -hmm. So what was the debut? Well, we had a couple of CDs out back then, but I'll never let you hear those. <laughs> <laughs> um they're long they're long gone now but we I guess it was around 2013 when we kind of strayed away from the old jazz and we were playing a lot of original music as handmade moments and that was a lot more fun and we were having a really good time playing original songs we were busking at farmers markets all the time and picking up gigs and anytime our rock and roll band couldn't play something handmade moments would play it just as the original project and at that point, we had picked up beatboxing, and um, so that was that had been added into the mix. And we were our sound had changed quite a bit. And we released our first album in 2014, and it's just called Handmade Moments. Right on. Yeah, I was kind of wondering because when you had arrived out here, you already had when I met you had some songs out, and you know you were well established. But to me, it felt like something brand new. And it wasn't until I embarked on the project for you that I realized a lot of those roots had gone back a, a lot longer than I was aware. Mm -hmm. What were some of the artists back in the day uh, that inspired you, Anna, even pre-handmade moments that mm -hmm. told you or moments that you had where you knew this was going to be your path? Yeah. The first, the first one was Judy Garland. I was obsessed with Judy Garland when I was a kid. I had every single one of her musicals on VHS, and she has so many. They're all very corny, but I loved them. And I still have all those songs memorized. Um, and when I was 11, my godmother, I have a really amazing set of godparents. They're a lesbian couple in their late 70s now, named Carol and Alice. And Alice was the one of the first female captains of the Navy, 
and Carol used to sing on Broadway with Lucille Ball. Wow. And so she really, Carol always was kind of nurturing my love for music because I always was, would talk about wanting to sing on Broadway. I was really into the show, the show tunes when I was a kid. And when I was 11, she gave me three CDs that changed my life. Billie Holiday, Ella Fitzgerald, and Louis Armstrong. And I just listened to those CDs. I wore them out. I knew every song. And I had a computer, an old, one of those huge ones, you know, that are on a desk <laughs> back in the day. And I had Napster, and I would download all of these jazz songs at that point. I was like 12 at the time. And Louis Armstrong, Billie Holiday, Ella Fitzgerald were my gateway into Lena Horne and uh, Etta James, Nina Simone, and all of these, all of these incredible jazz artists. Um, so that was my biggest, probably biggest inspiration are all these cool old jazz songs and the Beatles too, and some other bands. But mostly I was into jazz. Jazz. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, it's funny, you, not funny, but it's uh, remarkable that you bring up those artists because I feel like um, you, there's a depth and a sort of wisdom and sort of like beyond your years to the way you sing, the way you intonate and sort of uh, present your vocals in a very sort of old school jazz jazz like fashion. Um, and to think that you you know you learn from the cultural touchstones that you reference, it kind of clicks. It makes sense. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, even though your music has con- deviated considerably from that sort of blueprint yeah uh, it's it's very present still yeah yeah you know i wanted to also kind of inquire because you know i know you got a sound check in about 10 minutes um uh around the time that we started interacting and meeting uh you moved to california mm-hmm. and uh at the time you were living and driving in uh biodiesel bus Mm -hmm. could you just uh, describe that sort of time what the bus was like and what the existence of handmade moments maybe was like when you were living and traveling in the bus yeah so the bus was an old diesel short school bus that i got off craigslist for 900 bucks in (laughs) arkansas and it was the ugliest camo paint job you'd ever seen in your life but it was the um it was the band bus for don't stop please our rock and roll band and the band split up, I guess it was in 2015, the band officially split up, and we all had so many things that we bought together, but I wanted the bus. I said, like, give me the bus. I really <laughs> want that bus. So I got the bus, and um, our dream was to put a Cummins diesel engine in it, because those are known as the million mile engines, and they get good mileage for a diesel. And we wanted to run it off veggie oil, and we wanted to put solar panels on top and weld a stage on top. And we did all those things. It took us about six months to do all those things to the bus. We did it all in Arkansas with friends. And um, and we had our Argentine friend who's a muralist painted, amazing painter. His name is Mariano Padisha. And then we set out on the road, and our goal was to travel and play solar powered shows on top of our bus for free in the public kind of like this today except on top of a bus for free (laughs) outside and we just wanted to play everywhere we were tired of the grind of venues and ticket sales and all the things that come with being a up-and-coming musician it's such a gnarly grind sometimes and um we just wanted to give the music out for free and like take donations, sell CDs, but mostly just make a statement with the biodiesel bus and the solar powered sound and be completely off the grid. And so our goal was to drive it all the way to Argentina and play shows in between because we had just gotten back from a three month tour in Argentina before we started building the bus. And we had a lot of fans there and a lot of friends and it's such an amazing country. Um, so yeah, we started in Arkansas. We went to Miami all the way through the Keys and played shows on top of it and made our way across the United States to California. And our goal was to be in California for a bit in Oregon and then go down Baja, California and cross into um, Mexico and then cross on the ferry to Mazatlan. But we uh, got into a crash outside of Grass Valley, which held up our 
our plan. I guess we, our plan, we never got to complete our plan. Right, right. And that's, as I mentioned before we started, that's part of the reason why I wanted to talk with you because I find that um, you're already really uh, interesting and, and peculiar story uh, mm-hmm. musically. But the theme of this podcast... Um, overcoming adversity and sort of inspiration and when I first connected with you shortly after that happened when you were preparing Paw Paw Tree your most recent LP um, you explained to me this story and with it um, came the sort of rebirth and uh, sort of rehabilitation and relaunch of the group and um, that to me is just such an amazing story Mm. so uh, before we get into the rebirth um, just for the folks at home, explain how devastating the, the the accident really was. It was pretty terrible. We were in Nevada City, California. Now, I do want to say a week before this crash, we played the most incredible show on top of our bus in Ashland, Oregon at Lithia Park on Mother's Day. And it was so amazing. Um, and we were in Nevada City a week later. We had just given the bus a wash. It looked great. <laughs> we just done an oil change, a tune-up. We did so many things to get uh, to get ready to go down south. We had a show in San Luis Obispo, and we were going to play somewhere on the bus along the way. And we left Nevada City around, I guess it was like 1 p.m. or something like that on a Saturday. It was such a beautiful day. And we're 10 minutes outside on Highway 49. And Highway 49 is a highway, it's a two-lane highway, and every couple miles a passing lane will open on either side. And coming the opposite way from us, there was a passing lane that was merging back into one lane. And there were two cars fighting over who was going to be in the front in that merge. And so the lane merged and the cars hit each other and they were stuck together. And then they moved into our lane and hit us head on. And Joel was in the driver's seat. We had nowhere to go because there was no shoulder. There was just a drop off and a guardrail. So he just slammed on his brakes and went as far as he could to the side. Um, but it all came, it all happened so fast. They were probably going 65, 70 miles per hour. We were going about 50 because we were going up a hill and our bus was slow. Uh, and the impact caused Joel's femur to smash through his pelvis, breaking his hip and leaving him in a wheelchair for three months. And he had a bunch of skin grafting surgeries and... Um, open flesh wounds and I had a concussion and we had our videographer Timo actually that guy just met him on the way in (laughs) he was with us too uh he he had a broken shoulder bone and then our friend Hannah who was with us suffered a more severe concussion and she had a broken leg and an injured arm and uh we're really grateful that nobody died right the two people there were two people in each car that hit us um, and they were both injured too. Everybody was injured, but nobody died, so that was good. Yeah, definitely a blessing. Yeah. Wow, that's heavy, you know. And and when I sit across from here and ask you something like that, I just want to acknowledge that I know it's not easy for you to revisit it, especially mm-hmm. in such detail. Um, so I just want to say, you know, acknowledge that and honor that, yeah. and say that just only adds to how a remarkable and inspirational your story is. Yeah. So I really want to talk about you know, how you all came back from that and how it it was injected into the music and how I really feel like that tragedy and that near-death experience has sort of catapulted you guys into another realm as artists and people and uh, admiration of people from coast to coast and internationally. All that stuff deserves more than the two minutes we have before. (laughs) Soundcheck. So um, let's take a pause. I'm going to go enjoy your performance. And hopefully we can do another 10 minutes or so on the back end and then you'll have a whole episode Okay, awesome. sounds good. Thanks, Anna. Thanks, B. Yeah, I'll try that. <laughs> All right, so since we're in the back of a um, old fashioned buggy carriage, carriage uh, we thought it was only appropriate to play a 90s R&B jam. Yeah. This one's called Are You That Somebody? And it's an Aaliyah song. <laughs> Can y'all really feel me? East Coast, feel me. West Coast, feel me. Here we go now, dirty South, dirty, dirty. Can y'all really feel me? East Coast, feel me. West Coast, feel me. Here we go now, dirty South, dirty, dirty. Can y'all really
Coast, fill me up the West Coast, and here we go now. Boy, I've been watching you like a hawk in the sky, flying to me. My friend, boy, I promise you, if we keep bumping heads, I know that one of these days we gon' hook it up, probably talk on the phone. See, I don't know if that's good. I've been holding back this secret from you, probably shouldn't tell you, but. Sometimes I'm goody goody, right now I'm naughty naughty. Say yes, or say no, 'cause I really need somebody. Tell me that somebody, boy, won't you pick me up at the park right now, up the block while everyone sleep, sleep, sleep. I'll be waiting there with my trench, my gloves, my hat, so I'm low key. If you tell the world, don't sleep. You know that it'd be weak. Oh boy, I've been trusting you with my heart, my soul. Probably shouldn't tell you, but if I, if I let you know, you can't tell nobody. I'm talking about nobody. Are you responsible? Boy, I gotta watch my back, 'cause I'm not just anybody. Is it my goal? Is it your goal? Sometimes I'm good. Somebody, tell me that somebody. Baby girl, I'm the man from the big BA. Would you come hang around my way and listen to what I gotta say? I said, Oops, girl, I'm that man with the plan. Rock shows from here to Japan. People shake, shake to my hand. Say, Hey, baby girl, better known as Aaliyah. Cause the goosebumps and high fevers make a player hit us to believe it. Say, Hey, baby girl, you got to tell somebody. Cause I really need somebody. Tell me that somebody. If I, if I let you know, you can't tell nobody. I'm talking about nobody. I hope you're responsible. Boy, I gotta watch my back 'cause I'm not just anybody. Is it my goal? Is it your goal? Sometimes I'm goody goody. Right now I'm naughty naughty. Say yes or say no 'cause I really need somebody. Tell me that somebody. <laughs> Classic jam. In the uh, botanical garden. So, what are some immediate reactions? We're here with Anna Moss of Handmade Moments, and some immediate reactions to performing in this environment. It's very calming for me to be around so many trees. A lot of times when we play, we're indoors. It's late. There's a lot of electronic stuff. But I love being outdoors.、Um, sometimes it can be difficult, though, when you can't control the temperature for my horns, my sax,、right. and my bass clarinet. Sometimes I just have to, I have to be very,、uh, I have to be extra, extra careful with them, and they're touchy, you know. So I have to be aware and act accordingly. Right. I see you do a quick warm up, little tune up, get in this zone. With Joel, when you picked up the ba- was that a bass clarinet?、Mm-hmm. And it's really cool to hear both you and、uh, Joel approximate the typical bass line with, in his case, a sousaphone, or in your case, a bass clarinet.、Yeah. Really gives the songs a unique sound.、Um, How did you come upon those ideas? Is that a New Orleans thing, or does it predate your being in New Orleans? It predates New Orleans for sure. Joel Joel started playing sousaphone when he was well, I guess tuba when he was eleven. That was his first instrument, was the tuba, and my first instrument was the alto sax. But someone gifted me a bass clarinet, maybe four year, four or five years ago. They just left it at my house, and it was broken, and I got it fixed and started playing it. And it plays a lot like a alto sax, so I have really been enjoying playing it. It shows, and、uh, I think a little warm up here and there maybe might be needed for the outdoor elements, but but it, it's cool, you know. I remember、uh, I used to be in marching band when I was in middle school and high school, and、um, on cold nights, 
Um, cold cold nights are always the hardest before halftime when you're supposed to do your performance and everyone's instruments go out of tune. And I just remember my uh, my band director, Jim Swigert, he was kind of militant about it. He's like, keep warm air blowing through your horns. Keep on blowing warm air through your horns. So the whole time we're sitting there like during the football thing, <laughs> we're just like blowing very, very softly, very quietly to keep them from being super out of tune. Right on. Well, you know, before we had uh, taken a break to hear you and Joel perform so beautifully through a capacity crowd here, you know, super sold out, as I'm told, uh, in this amazing amphitheater, we had talked uh, in detail about the accident that you had in the van and uh, some of the nature of the injuries. So uh, we won't have to revisit that. Obviously, people on the pod will have just heard it. But I want to talk about how that, uh, that next period of time in your lives when you were here in Northern California, injured and uh, immobilized in a lot of ways, and uh, you know how you were able to first rehabilitate yourselves physically, mm -hmm. and then how you channeled that energy into what became your third LP, Paw Poetry. The rehab process was pretty easy to do just because in that moment, after that happened, at least for me, I was just so grateful to be alive. I was very, uh, I was very happy, um, and the challenges ahead didn't seem like that big of a deal. Like, sure, Joel was in a wheelchair for three months, but we were ready to rock it and do the thing, and we were so happy to be living in Nevada City um, because it's such an amazing community, and we love the people there so much. It's not the easiest city town to get around in in a wheelchair right <laughs> as you can imagine it's just so hilly uh, but we did it and it was a good workout for me <laughs> um, and I think the accident as much as it totally sucked um, it forced us to slow down a little bit because we've just been on the road for so many years for over five years nonstop and when we got in the crash we had to be still and we had to take it easy and that's where we wrote some of in my opinion oh well, our favorites my favorite songs that we have so far a lot of them aren't recorded yet like hole in the ocean um which you played tonight which we played tonight uh but we wrote where do you find the time and um so many songs and coffee chocolate earth i i finished while joel was in the hospital i was sitting outside of the hospital on the bench outside when i finished that song and like so many songs came out of those moments of just downtime and you can't do anything you can't do what you want you have to be there um going by the rules of whatever the doctor says so it's the greatest time to just play music yeah and, and this is the first time that you'd actually written and recorded in northern california right we uh we wrote a lot of the songs there we recorded it in arkansas actually Paw Paw Tree was recorded in Arkansas. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then came out on Jumpsuit, which is a Nevada City-based uh, label and community. So, yeah, I was often confused. I met you in California, interacted with you in California, seen yeah. you perform, but I know you're from Arkansas. What are some maybe of the principal differences in, say, the art communities and the music scenes, say, in NorCal or Nevada City and then, you know, where you came of age in the Ozarks or even a bustling metropolis like Little Rock. Uh, what are some right. de definitive uh, you know, juxtapositions between those two worlds? And, and also, how does that affect you as an artist? It's, um, it's, it's a hard question because there are such amazing musicians in Arkansas. Some of my favorite musicians that I've ever heard in my life live in Arkansas and that have inspired me to do what I'm doing and to be political and to say what you want to say. Um, a lot of my greatest influences have been Ar Arkansas musicians. And California is amazing too. I've met so many incredible musicians. But I think in some ways, the musicians I've met in, in Arkansas are a little more bold because they have to be. Because Arkansas is very, uh, overall, a pretty conservative place. And to speak out against what you see um, speaking out against the wrongdoings of the world and what you see around you is is a more bold thing to do in a place like Arkansas than sure. California where in California it's it's the norm right. everybody knows about climate change everybody knows um, these certain things but in Arkansas it's, it's not so much the norm so people are very brave I feel like and I'm very much attracted to that and there's a, some profound and uh, potent messaging in your music that honestly didn't really 
pick up on as much in the past as I did this afternoon. Um, what's that like, I guess, we talk about being brave or bold in Arkansas, like being a woman and having, you know, you commented on uh, police action earlier, and, uh, you know, you've had a few tracks, you know, where you explained today that, you know, the messaging behind them was really deep and had some political leanings. Um, do you find that there's any sort of backlash in uh, Arkansas, or people maybe shun you in any regard, or do you think they're even more drawn to you because it's so bold, or both? People that don't like our music don't come to our shows, so I never see them, I never meet them, and they don't ever say anything on the internet either that I've noticed, so I've never uh, felt that. In Arkansas, we have a very strong, supportive fan base, and I think, um, I think that overpowers anything else. And it and in Arkansas, I want to also say that a lot of a lot of the states that people kind of overlook um, and see just as red states or, or whatever people might think, you have to understand that there's a lot of ger- gerrymandering happening and there's a lot of the majority of the people in that state in these places are just people like you and me and they they get it, like they see what's going on. They're not being represented by their politicians. That's for sure, uh, but people get it and they uh, rise up to the occasion, and and that's a super powerful feeling in a place like Arkansas. It feels it's exhilarating to be to be there and just hang out with everybody and yeah, sing with them. Yeah, you had mentioned earlier, probably had never had the opportunity to to ask this in uh, in the past or maybe at all. Is is who are some of those musicians you say that in Arkansas that you see there's some great musicians, people that really inspired you to step up and and speak your truth or sing your truth? Or is there anyone that we might not know about that we should? So many. Um, Flip off pirates, incredible band from Fayetteville. Uh, Adam Fawcett, he's a musician from Little Rock, amazing. You can check him out on Spotify. Adam Fawcett. Um, and one of my favorite songwriters and singers, Melissa Carper, she plays in a band called the Buffalo Gals. So beautiful. And Opal Agafia and the Sweet Nothings, Arkansas, Dana Louise and the Glorious Birds, um, Heirloom, so many incredible, incredible musicians. Sounds like a really diverse scene of music, yeah. you know, and, and I'm glad that you were able to reel off a few of those so that people that are curious of like what's in the DNA of handmade moments or who can't really put their finger on what Arkansas roots music or mm-hmm. Arkansas jazz music or whatever it is sounds like um, now they'll have some uh, starting points myself included yeah um, I just want to wrap up with two two things that are close to my heart one is uh, festival culture and I've noticed I've been hearing from my friends uh, I've got a friend named Jill who has a company called the gnome and she just did a uh, elixir bar at uh, electric forest oh and, yeah I right so she's one of my best friends and sh- and she knows that i'm a big fan of yours and i've worked with you in the past so on her drive home she was called me just to sing your praises and and Aww. talk about you know how she felt connected to your music and then i've got another friend from like the jam world in atlanta named brett who's booked you oh, guys, yeah, I know brett. right <laughs> and he's also like yo handmade moments is is the shit and i just it's really amazing to see this uh growth in the fan base and as you guys start to touch more and more people i was just curious like how's that feel you mentioned before five years of hard grinding a near-death experience Mm -hmm. but now you're starting to see some dividends of Mm -hmm. that you're really affecting people and and you become an in-demand artist have any emotions or ideas associated with that sort of surge in popularity or just trying to stay humble with it it feels really good when i think about it validating right i don't think about it enough because i'm we're always we're still like always struggling it seems you know (laughs) we're always like trying to you know trying to get our music out there the best way that we can and and i always still feel like the underdog all the time you know we we don't have any uh we have a booking agent but we don't have any representation other than that and we're, we're pretty independent so um it's hard to keep up with everything and I, I'm always late, you know, <laughs> I feel like I'm just behind the times. But I, I was thinking about it today. Our last, you know, we our first show in Berkeley was actually just busking at the farmer's market. Somebody reminded me they saw us there a few years ago, and it's cool to play a sold-out show here in Berkeley. Um, I have to remember that things are always getting better, and 
Um, but I, we have so much on our minds right now. We're recording. I would say at least 70% of our music is unrecorded. And I feel the pressure to record it, you know, because mm. who knows when the next car accident could happen. I hope mm. that never happens, but you never know. Yeah. And I, sometimes I think about it. If, you know, if we, if we did pass in that car accident that happened, like all those songs would have been lost. So right. I, um, tomorrow's not promised. So you, you got to exactly. get that stuff out on wax and out to the people. Exactly. Exactly. So that's on our minds a lot. We have a lot of projects going on. Um, we're releasing a cover album in a few weeks. Um, folks have been asking us for that for a long time, and I don't know. We never really, we never really thought about it or put too much thought into it. And then we were in New Orleans, and we have a friend who has a beautiful studio, and so this is the first thing we've recorded in New Orleans, and we're super excited about it. It's so fun recording yeah. covers because you have a little bit less attachment to the songs, and you can just have so much fun. All right. And I think that covers are really a, a unique part of your DNA. The first thing I ever saw of you ever, I'm a huge Aaliyah fan, and there's a video of you guys doing Are You That Somebody, like yeah. on the back of a tractor. Yeah. And then, uh, and then I remember seeing another time you're doing Erica Badu phone down. Yeah. You know? And then uh, tonight, obviously, opening with the Blondie cut. Those are all going to be on our cover album. So. Okay. Well, I don't want to spoil it. I just want to say that it's a really awesome part of what you guys do. And I think, I mean, where else? This is the, la the last thing I really wanted to talk about. But where else but New Orleans to record this record? And you guys, kind of your home when you're not on the road at this point, right? Yeah. You've moved there. So let's, it's my favorite city. The last four episodes previous to this were about Jazz Fest and the aftermath yeah. and stuff. So uh, it's kind of still connecting that flow. Yeah. Um, how did you guys end up there, and, and uh, what's the future hold for Handmade Moments in the Crescent City? We have been playing music there for years, touring, and every time we go, we spend weeks there. Just really, kind of like we would here in Oakland, too, we'd, or in Berkeley. We'd come to the Bay and be here for a while. We did that with New Orleans a lot, busking and playing shows and just picking up gigs. And we went there in our bus, back when we had our bus. Um, and we've always loved it. And last year, after we released... Paw, Paw Tree, we were on this huge tour and we stopped at all these cities and we decided that we needed to move somewhere and and like rent a house and just not be traveling all the time. Sure. And we were trying to figure out where. We really loved Nashville, we love Oakland, we love Brooklyn, so many places, Atlanta, but New Orleans, that's when we were really sold on it. We toured through New Orleans, it was about this time last year in July, and that's the time when people don't like New Orleans because it's so yeah. hot but we loved it it was amazing in July it's wonderful it rains a lot so that's really cooling and there's less people so it's more chill right. but the music is still solid and uh, we played a show last summer there and hung out for several days and met an incredible luthier that fixed our upright bass and um we still hang out with him, <laughs> and it's nice. just been great. We decided then, like, hey, we're going to move to New Orleans. And I've kind of known that for a long time. For years, I, I thought, like, I should move there um, and make a jazz record, which is something I'm going to do this winter, nice. too, on the side. I want to make a jazz record. Right on. And that's the place that's to do it. That's good to know, of course. Yeah, there's just so many. Every time I go there, every time I go there, I sit in with jazz bands, and every time... It's like the best band I've ever sang with. And it's just like right here, right now. We don't rehearse or anything. I just sit in like during the gig. And it's so amazing. And there's no other place in the world where I've nope. ever gotten that experience. Yeah. So that's one it's of the main just, reasons. I mean, I was so thrilled to hear that you guys were moving there. And it just makes such sense yeah. for you to sink into that culture. Because like you said, everywhere you go, the cats just playing everywhere doesn't matter like what the style is or what the gig is like you show up and you, you're guaranteed that you're going to get a high quality high integrity musical performance yeah. and it might be for 50 people it might be for 500 it might mm -hmm. even be for five mm -hmm. but the magic is always present yeah. there like nowhere else it's amazing and it's good for us too because we're both horn players joel's been playing with some brass bands while while we're there and nice. we have time off and i've been playing my saxophone a lot my bass clarinet so it's nice to keep our chops up with other horn players because we're when we're on the road it's just us you know yeah. we, we don't have other horn players around so it's nice to surround ourselves with dope horn players in new orleans yeah horn players and drummers in yeah. new orleans drummers. And speaking of drummers a uh, friend of the show derek freeman or derek smoker's got soul brass band which is out of new orleans so i'm going to 
take it upon myself to connect you with them. They yeah. have a, they are awesome at sort of the revamping and New Orleans New Orleansizing uh, popular music yes. into a sort of like a brass band quasi format. Um, and I've just been kind of waiting for you guys to connect, but I'm just going to take it upon myself to put you together. He came on the show a few months back, and uh, you know he's just really doing something different with the brass band blueprint. Yeah, one foot in tradition and one foot in contemporary. Yeah, not unlike you guys. Yeah, I love yeah. that. I think it's super important. And that's alive and well down there. So yeah. Oh man, is yeah. it? Yeah. So you just did a big tour with Yonder Mountain String Band National Tour, mm-hmm. which exposed you to even another demographic. Yeah. Um, what's next after the cover album? Uh, you guys going to go on the road? I thought I might have heard you say earlier you'll be back in California in the fall. Yeah. So after this. We're going up to Oregon Country Fair, and then we're playing up at Northwest String Summit in Oregon, where we're going to reunite with Yonder and do some fun collaborations yeah. with them. And then we go back to New Orleans for a day, play a concert <laughs> in Florida, in Panama City Beach, and then we go to Europe, and we'll be touring for six wow. weeks straight in Europe. And during that time... This I, isn't your first time over there, right? No, we went last year. It was awesome. Amazing. Right. And now they're having and you back. We're coming back for six weeks. And we're going to be um, releasing our album sometime around there. I'm not sure yet. The cover album. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then we come back and play a little festival here in California in September called the La Sierra Hoedown. Interesting. Where's that located? That's in John's Johnsville Bowl. It's up in the Sierras in okay. like a ski area. Right and on. then um, And then we'll go back to New Orleans for a bit. And we're playing at a festival this fall called Hillberry that railroad earth throws in arkansas okay and um and then we're going to be recording all fall and winter original tunes right some of what we heard tonight a lot of what you heard tonight yeah we'll be we'll be recording this fall and winter and that's our plan is just to hunger down in our house and um get it all polished and then go into the studio and lay it down right on well we look forward to that and i heard it a taste of what you got coming tonight and it's very exciting i kept saying to myself i don't know this one i don't know this one but it turns out that a lot of that stuff hasn't been recorded or released yet. yeah so that's exciting stuff and i want to say that it was a real joy to sit down and kind of get the scoop with you and hopefully when you come back in september we could do something with joel yeah i think that this is going to be really popular and i think that people are going to want to know his side of it and and even more about handmade (laughs) moments because you guys are a real colorful (laughs) duo and no one else is really doing what you're doing and Mm. and you bring a really great energy to the performance and to just the hangs yeah so i'm glad to be on your radar and i think that the world is a better place for handmade moments thank you so we're gonna sign off uh i'm gonna connect you with some of my good new orleans folks because i really feel like uh, once you plug in there really if you can just stay there for a couple of weeks without having to dart away oh, man. Um, magic's gonna happen i saw the video that you uh, showed me with uh, joshua and you said there's another oh, one i gotta yeah. say yeah i mean it's just so amazing that whole community down yeah. there is so beautiful i love it yeah, it's so, amazing i yeah. when we first moved there we had it was in march and we had six weeks off which we've never had that much time <laughs> off in our my entire life right. i was like what am i doing but we, we were recording a lot too um but yeah i didn't leave the city and I, I never even crossed the bridge and it was the most incredible feeling to just be there stationary yeah and yeah. walker i know i don't ever drive i just walk around and take the streetcar and ride my bike and it's just so amazing it's a good life <sighs> yeah. Yeah. yeah right on well, we'll catch up with you on, on the back end of Europe and uh, the fall. And uh, hopefully, you know, there will be more Handmade Moments and Up for Life podcasts coming together in the future. I mean, Yay. really enjoyed this. And I want to say thanks for having me out to the show. Yeah. And uh, thanks to the Redwood Grove for allowing us this beautiful place to have this interview. Yes. I'm going to sign off. This is B. Getz with Anna Moss from Handmade Moments. You've been listening to the Up for Life podcast from Berkeley, California. And we'll see you next time. I can make you, I can make you, I can make you put your phone down.
cruise through the city, I can make it put your phone down. Ain't gonna text nobody when you're with me, I can make it put your phone down. So you can show me attention, and I cut mine off too. Boy, that'll help when I listen, I can make it put your phone down. Baby, we don't need it. And when you get a text message, like you don't see it, I can make you put your phone down Tell me, do you copy? I can make you put your phone down Boy, that ain't gonna stop me, I can make you put your phone down I can make you, I can make you, I can make you put your phone down mm -hmm. I can make you put your phone down Gonna check it again, and I can make it put your phone down. Riding in a drop, hair blowing in the wind, baby, I will put my phone down. Cause when you talk, I'ma listen. I can make it put your phone down. Leave it at the crib, guarantee you wouldn't miss it. I can make it put your phone down. And it wouldn't leave your pocket. I can make it put your phone down. Probably won't even know how to unlock it. I can make it put your phone down. See your friend call them, but forget them. You make you put your phone down. Your mama probably think you out there missing. I can make you put your phone down. I can make you, I can make you, I can make you put your phone down. Mm -hmm. I can make you put your phone down. I can make you, I can make you, I can make you put your phone down. Yes, indeedy. Thanks to Miss Anna Moss and Joel and their bread truck Gary and uh, amazing, phenomenal, super interview. Can't say enough about Anna and Handmade Moments and that freaking Aaliyah cover and Phone Down by Badu. I mean, I could go on. Um, they have a covers album coming out, as you heard, so keep your ears peeled for that. And if you're down in New Orleans, you know, and you're hearing this, and you know, fold fold my people into the flow down there. All my New Orleans cats making music down there. These two are something special, and i uh, love to see them get sort of swept away into uh, what goes on down there in New Orleans with the collaborations and the sort of relationships and such. Speaking of relationships, I'm uh, lucky and... Uh, privilege to have a sweet relationship with my boys in Lettuce. You're hearing them perform their song Trapezoid from Rage Rocks a few weeks back. Um, and the reason I bring up Lettuce is because that's how I know my next guest. Uh, I was introduced to Hillary Gleason on Jam Cruise a few years back by none other than Jesus Coombs. Um, and basically, he just said that Hillary was a special cat, special gal. And uh, she was doing big things in this world and that, you know, I should be uh, paying attention, if you will. And this was long before I had a show. He was just giving me the 411 on somebody doing it big and doing it well and doing important things. So, alas, you know, Jesus speaks, you listen. So I've kept an eye on Hillary and seen what she's been up to and you know, listened to the different projects she's been a part of. And she's collaborated with Lettuce on a number of initiatives. And uh, I'm not going to spoil it. She talks about it at length, and she tra traces her history uh, with some of the fellows, like uh, in Lettuce and Kraz and such, and, and sort of connects her activism and uh, uh, organization level to uh, the music scene and uh, some actual musicians that mean a great deal to me, and I know mean a great deal to a lot of you. And I've always been really impressed with Hillary, um, how she carries it and how she presents it, and, and she's just... Uh, you know, super gal. So with that, we're going to hear the Denver Skyline drum troop on the end of this trapezoid, and then about 30 minutes with Hillary Gleason of Level.
and we're live uh, here in downtown San Francisco at the Park 55 Hotel, um, the tail end of the Lettuce John Schofield run, and you're listening to the Up for Life podcast. I'm your host, B. Getz, and I am uh, lucky and privileged to be sitting here with Hillary Gleason of Level and a myriad of other endeavors, activist, fundraiser, and uh, vital and vibrant part of not just the lettuce music community, but the music community at large. So welcome to the show, Hillary. Thank you, and thank you for having me. Uh, well, we're stoked to have you here, and we're, you know, the tail end of the lettuce run, as I mentioned, and you were lucky to catch the last night when you came into town. One night, yeah. Um, was hoping to catch them in Portland this weekend, yeah. late night, so I'm kind of making my way through the Warfield now. Um, Great American Music Hall, but last night was the first time at SF Jazz, and it's a beautiful space, and so fun to see Schofield and Deitch go back and forth. I mean, that's my favorite dynamic when you have Schofield on stage, is watching him and Adam, who've kn- known each other for a long time and played together, but it's, the space last night was incredibly just warm to that relationship and super fun to watch. I would agree, and uh, I gotta say that my first experience hearing Adam play was with Schofield when they were in a band together back around 2002. I saw them in Boulder, and shortly after that I saw my first Lettuce shows and then didn't see Lettuce for years after that. But I too was really impressed with the sort of kinetic chemistry uh, between John and, and Adam and then how that sort of permeated everybody else. Yeah. So. We're definitely lucky to have seen that show, and I actually was uh, reflecting on my way over here about how I know you, Um, and it was actually through Lettuce uh, on Jam Cruise uh, 2016, I want to say. Jesus introduced us, and he said, you guys are both big parts of our crew, and you guys should know each other, and, you know, when Jesus speaks, you know, you listen, so here we are, Um, and I think that's pretty cool that you made it a point to get down here. Um, You mentioned that you have a conflict uh, because you're going to be in Tahoe. So let's start there with, you know, some of your endeavors, and then maybe we'll backtrack a little bit. What are you doing up there? So I just brought on Winter Wondergrass as a new partner. Um, I run a company called Level, and we are a consulting firm, um, and we help our clients connect with nonprofit causes. And so with Winter Wondergrass, they reached out, and the founder of that festival, actually, Scotty Stoughton, called us and he said I want to do more and I want to do it better and I only want one team to run it and that's me and my friend Tori Pittarelli who both fall under this umbrella that is level Um, and that one in particular is really nice Um, I started this company in 2017 and have been trying to get the word out about what I do and and how I can help to connect people with nonprofits and and help them do more but I think what Scotty said is perfect. He said, I want to do more and I want to do it better. And that's kind of the angle that we take with my company is like, hey, we all are creating these platforms, right? So there's uh, Winter Wondergrass Festival or Lettuce as a band or Up Full Life. And we're all trying to do our thing and get our hustle in and, you know, make this thing better. And um, the way that we can collaborate to do that, I think, is really special. And so with Winter Wondergrass, we didn't really know what that was going to look like yet, um, but we had a lot of conversations around what this partnership can be and what we can do together, and um, we're now helping them to tell their story, um, which is a really powerful thing. So they already work with a lot of nonprofits. They have a huge philanthropic um, effort there, but they needed somebody to come on and help them do that a little bit better and have those conversations with nonprofit partners and move the needle on what they're trying to do. And so we're now helping them with that and, and working on their media relations team and making sure that we get the word out about this awesome, uh, very conscious and connected music festival that exists at ski resorts in the bitter cold. And, and it's a really cool thing that they have going on down there. And we're really happy to be a part of the team now and help tell that story about a collection of music lovers coming together, listening to bluegrass music and then enjoying the snow and the elements. And that's really cool. That sounds really cool. And we have to apologize. We got a flight crew rolling by, rolling a bunch of suitcases. So you might hear some background noise. I think we'll stick it out for a little while. And then if it keeps getting loud, maybe we'll relocate, but I appreciate your patience. Um, that's really exciting. Uh, one of the things that really sold me on, I'm from the East Coast originally, from Philly area, and uh, 
been living out on the West Coast for a little over five years, and the conscious festival scene on the West Coast and the amount of attention that these events put on the educational aspects and activism aspects and awareness aspects of the culture and the community is is really uh, something that I'm impressed by and drawn to, and uh, part of the reason why I wanted to talk to you is I would like to be more involved in those type of uh, communications and connected connectivity, if you will. So, um, with regard to like the work that you do, a lot of people out there are going to be like, well, how do, how do you become a fundraiser? How do, how do you start a consulting firm? All that. But that's, that's years down the road. So let's take it back to, you know, your first maybe uh, peek behind the curtain of the music scene and, and activism and when that crystallized moment you had where you were like, this is my calling. Sure. So I have been a music fan my whole life. My dad is a deadhead, and when I would get out of school in the summer starting the year that I was 10, um, he would take a couple weeks off and we'd go catch a band. So we went on Little Feet tour that first summer, and we caught something like 16 dates on the East Coast. We went from North Carolina up to Atlantic City and beyond, um, seeing Little Feet as many nights as we could. Um, and the next summer we did Hot Tuna and my dad would call me out of school in high school and say I got second row tickets to Tom Petty and he just believed so much that music can have an incredibly powerful part of his life and my life and he showed me how to do concerts and have your water with you and you know do the show right Um, and he would always say that if you see a good rock and roll show you can ride that high for two weeks three weeks you know longer and Um, that stuck with me so when I went to college I found a group of friends that loved music too and we went to school at the University of Tennessee and saw as much music as we possibly could have during our four year four and a half years there Um, and I saw lettuce for the first time when I was in college um, at this tiny festival called Joe Miyoki um, that was a one and one time only festival in North Carolina Um, and by that you remember the year that would be 2012 um, and they were they did one set of lettuce and then one set of everyone orchestra with a bunch of the members of lettuce James Casey was there at the time they had Jimmy Herring from widespread panic on guitar and we were just amazed and managed to sneak backstage and that was the first time I met Adam or Jesus um, and I, I kind of saw it as a one-off thing um, And I also, and we should come back to this, um, had already begun my work in nonprofits at this time. So when I was 17, I wanted to be a brain surgeon and was interning with a brain surgeon from Duke Hospital where I grew up and ended up helping him build this neurosurgical training program. Um, The issue at hand being that there were only three neurosurgeons in the country. And we have about 25 at Duke Hospital and 20 more down the road at UNC. And so that disparity in numbers really stuck out to this neurosurgeon, Dr. Michael Hagland, and he asked me to help figure out how we could change that. So we buy used medical equipment from Duke Hospital, ship it over to Uganda, start to bring over teams from Duke um, to do neurosurgical training twice a year. And... So I went and did that when I was 18 the summer before I went to college and realized I didn't need to be a brain surgeon at all. I got there and my skill set was so well suited to really the tour manager role um, of this thing. So making sure that the bus picked us up every morning and that everyone had lunch that day. And um, so I went during my time in college, in addition to seeing as much music as I possibly could, I was pursuing global studies degree um, with a focus on Africana studies and, and knowing I was going to go into global health. So I moved to New York City in 2013, and on my first night there, I went and saw this band Soul Live that I had always loved because my sister had a CD of theirs in her car in high school. And which I inherited when she went to college. And um, so I went and saw Soul Live that night and was just in absolute tears in the third row of the show, in part because I knew no one in New York City um, and was totally terrified to be a Brooklyn Bull that night alone, and in part because I was so 
incredibly overwhelmed with happiness. And after the show, James Casey, who I had met at Joe Miyoki, and Marco Benevento, who had crashed on my floor in Knoxville, Tennessee, via a mutual friend of ours, um, both ran off stage and they grabbed me and they said, Tennessee, what are you doing here? And I pretty much told them that I had no idea because it was my first night in New York. And so they, they were stoked to see me and so gracious. And they brought me to the side of the stage at Brooklyn Bowl. And I met Eric Krasno for the first time. And he said something like, oh man, it's your first night in New York City. I remember when I first moved here. And that's, you know, huge. Here's this. I'm, we're playing here the next seven nights and I'm gonna put you on the list for all of them. And if you don't know what to do or you don't, you're bored or lonely, come hang out, we'll be your friends. And I did, I went to a couple more of the Bowl Live shows that week and met some of the cats from Tadashi Trucks and, and got to know some of the Soul Live guys and Lettuce guys and that was really my entrance into the music scene and the jam scene in a real way. Um, and so I owe a lot of my story to Kraz. Um, and the way that Level came together is I was working at a big nonprofit in New York at the time, Global Citizen. They throw a 60,000 music, 60, person music festival in Central Park every year. Um, and I would be having conversations with musicians about what I do and my love for Uganda and, and that I work in nonprofits. And they would say stuff like, oh man, that's so cool. I wish I could do that. And I want to help them do that. And so when I moved out to Denver and left Global Citizen, you know, there weren't the same kinds of nonprofits stationed in Denver that there are on the East Coast because nobody would set up something international and have you fly out of the middle of the country. So I was sort of at a crossroads professionally. I had left this job in New York and was a little bit burnt out there um, and saw this niche was which was all of these conversations that I'd had along the way that just disappeared you know you have them at a bar after an incredible show in New York and, and there's no follow-up there and so I started to think to myself okay you know the music industry pretty intimately at this point and you understand how nonprofits work and you know musicians and what if you were to bridge those things together and that's what we're trying to do and um, I think one of the things that makes this such a niche is that nonprofits and bands email in totally different ways the way that they communicate is is you know it can work but it takes a lot of understanding on both sides of things when things get done and how quickly and whether people are on tour and so I think I ha with the understanding of both sides of that coin I can actually really streamline those communications and help set up initiatives in a way that I haven't really seen done before. That's an amazing uh, story arc um, of yours. I got to say, when I wanted to sit down with you, I mean, I knew you were an interesting person. I follow you on social media, you know, read your bio and prepared for this interview. But when you lay it out in a chronological fashion like that, with all that serendipity involved, it, it's funny you bring up, I mean, Bowl Live was always such a seismic event in the music community every year, and when it comes back, it will be again. Um, so for you to magically arrive at the first night of Bowl Live and to, you know, connect with, you know, those guys, Marco, uh, James, but particularly Kraz, he's like the Kevin Bacon of the music world. Like, he touches he's six degrees of separation in any direction. So I'm not surprised it was him that was like the Papa Bear of the situation. Yeah, and he, of course, later that night introduced me to Questlove, which on my first night in New York City truly blew my mind. I mean, I called my friends and family the next day and told them, I'm, I'm never coming back, you know, don't call me, I'm hanging out with Questlove now. I was, like, blown away. Um... But I actually did some writing about this a couple of days ago um, because I want to commemorate that story. I have so much gratitude for the serendipity of it all, but also the kindness and, and warmness that was given to me. I mean, the hospitality that Kraz showed me in that moment or the recognition, you know, the face recognition that James had from the festival that is something I always want to carry and pass on and it's really important to me to give that warm welcome to new people in the music scene because 
my reception of that and that moment is etched in my life forever. Um, and so to know that you can have that impact on people in these in these moments that, you know, they uh, Kraz is about the nicest guy in the world. I'm not sure that he thought twice about that moment. And I told him maybe a year ago, I'm like, you know that you're the reason that, that I'm able to start this company, that I'm able to be at these, you know, places at the right time and see... I think I have seen some of the best music on the planet. And a lot of it is so deeply steeped in gratitude for me and I try to really focus on that as this is a collective effort and all of our experiences are based on the friendships that you build along the way um, and I'm, I'm deeply grateful well it shows it shows in how you you know communicate and treat people and interact and how you carry it professionally and so forth I think it's important to lead by example like that and then you know explaining why because you were uh, you know, you're grateful for the, the treatment and the warm welcome and the sort of guidance that you got from some major cats. And, you know, that, that's not easy to come by, but it happens for a reason. And you, you get out of what you put into it. And obviously, we're putting a lot of good energy into things. Um, that's kind of like why I'm doing this in general, is I've lived through a traumatic life experience. Um, and which I've talked about on the show, but it's not important what it was. It's more just that I came out the other end with. Uh, motivation and uh, a need to affect people in a positive way um, beyond just entertaining them maybe with a story but you know connecting people and spreading you know wisdom understanding not necessarily my own but that I collected from folks like you and all the guests that have come on the podcast already Um, so I wanted to maybe I don't know ask you more directly um, for people out there that are listening who maybe are going to the shows and uh, seeing a you know, permaculture action table or level set up or any of these you know, standard bearers for really making a difference in the community, um, how can the average fan who doesn't know Eric Krasno, who can, is only going to the shows that they can afford from the regular job, I mean, the people that you really need to mobilize, really, we're not trying to preach to the choir here so yeah. what would be some steps or advice or maybe some guidance you might give to a young woman or or man um, but we're, that would m- motivate them inspire them to like follow their calling well I think that a lot of this has to do with connection and that is just person to person and so I've had people come up to me at shows and say I follow you on Instagram and I love what you're doing and, and I usually say to them, well, DM me, you know, I want to hear about why they love what I'm doing. And, and if you see something at a show that you like or want to connect with, um, Headcount is a great example, right? Headcount tables are at a ton of shows, um, including lettuce shows. And when I've stood there and volunteered um, with them and registered some voters, it's like those conversations that you're having, we now are very... I'm very grateful to live in a society where connection is instant. You know, if you hear my name, Hillary Gleason, you can find me on Instagram in about 30 seconds. And so to be able to follow up on those conversations is really important. Um, So, hey, I love what you're doing. I love this table. Or, you know, we met at the show last night. That has an ability in this day and age to make connections in a way that wasn't available really before that. and now you know when you're going to see people again. And, and I get excited to make connections with friends who I've met on the road, you know. And so that con- connectivity, I think, is really amazing. And, you know, people want to talk about social media maybe not being the best place all the time in terms of mental health or comparison or whatever. But I've been able to make some really incredible relationships there. And um, I think that for the average Joe, it's like, Find out what you're passionate about. What makes your eyes light up when you see it? Um, and follow that and connect with that and reach out to people. You know, send the emails, send the DMs, and, and just say that you want to get on a phone call and, and talk about whatever that topic is. And um, the older I get, the more I sort of get into my individual hobbies and causes and stuff. And diving into that is a great thing. I mean, I want to learn something every day for the rest of my life. And so, especially the things that make your eyes light up, 
follow that lead and follow that dream and talk to everyone that you can that's in that field that's ever done something and invite your friends to be a part of it and that's really how movements grow is what what is calling to your heart first identifying that and if you don't know send me a dm on instagram and i'd be happy to help you figure it out because i think we all have something inside of us that is just longing to move and shake and and so discovering what that is for yourself is is huge and and very life-changing um for me to have this experience where i went to uganda at 18 i mean that shook me to my core let's talk about that a little bit um what about that experience i didn't mean to yank the mic away from you but i want to go deeper there what about that experience uh shook you to your core and what did that motivate you to do well i mean everything i think that was the first trip that i had really you know been outside of the resort towns in the caribbean and um and having an experience that's completely different and on the other side of the world and all of that at 18 years old is is a lot but also this project is vitally important in this area so the leading cause of death in uganda is head injury and that is you know their primary form of transportation in the cities is these motorcycle taxis and they'll put four or five people on them at a time and um There are also instances, and we see this every year when we go, of people with huge tumors in their head, and they'll say, like, yeah, he hasn't been able to walk for three years, and then we heard that you were here to do brain surgery. And so the need is really there, and just spending time in the hospital, I mean, they have accepted me as their family, and... and, when the families of the patients are staying with them at the hospital they're sleeping on the floor next to the cots there and i just i think it was my first real moment of recognizing my privilege is so extreme i mean my my dad works at duke hospital and if i had an injury or something going on we were going there and duke is one of the best hospitals in the country and so to see the people of uganda and the the commitment level of the families to be there in the hospital with them and the lack of sort of these creature comforts that I had seen and experienced in my life. Bridging that gap and trying to provide to them the best level of care and conversation um, that I could and supporting that was huge for me. Um, And it was something that I didn't know that I cared about or was going to be good at or anything and and everything just fell into place for this to be a life-changing moment and I think that I think that those things happen throughout your life and you have to be awake and conscious and reflect on them in order sometimes to learn all of the lessons from those experiences so I write a lot in a journal and, and reflect often on that first trip to Uganda because I was just so young and happened to be in, I, I don't know how, how it came to be in a lot of ways. Um, Sometimes that's how the best things happen, you yeah. know, just out of thin air. Yeah, um, and I felt very lucky going into college that I had had this experience right before and I've always known exactly what I wanted to do from that moment. Um, and not everyone has that. And I, I think that that life-shaking moment doesn't necessarily happen for everyone in, in the same way that it did with me where you find your you know, philanthropic cause and that's what you're going to dedicate your life to. It's not always so simple for people. Um, or it hasn't called out to you yet. And so that's part of why I started level two is like, if you don't have a cause, let's have that conversation. What is it that, that you think is the biggest issue facing our world right now? Is it hunger? Is it education? Is it clean water? You know, do any of those move the needle for you? Or do you want to talk about any of those more? And helping people to find that cause is really important. Um, and something that I try to help my friends and clients navigate so with lettuce it was like they had always said oh that's so cool that you do that Um, and lettuce is one of my clients now Um, but it came out of these conversations oh that's so cool that you do nonprofit stuff 
And I'm like, yeah, so what's your cause? What's, what makes you tick? And they are so many members of that band, and they have, as you know, lots of opinions that differ, and they love to chat it out on the tour bus, and they read the news and, you know, talk through things with each other, but there's a lot of differing opinions, and so for them it made total sense to go with Headcount, which is saying, you know, bipartisan organization that's saying, hey, you have an opinion, go to the polls and use it. That's easy enough for all of us in terms of level and lettuce to agree upon. And then the guys in Lettuce said, that's great, we love Headcount, we want to support that, but we also really care about hunger issues, and we also really care about social justice issues, particularly around race and around the work of the ACLU. So what we did for the first tour with Lettuce was say, okay, these are the three things that you care about. Let's activate on those three things throughout the tour. Every venue in the country that you play will have an ACLU, a Y hunger, and a headcount table. And we'll bring those issues to your fans and use Lettuce touring the country as a platform for change. Um, And so there was no big story from them or one big cause or something that had happened to one of them that led them to their cause but it was things that throughout their life when they're really prodded with the question what do you care about what makes you tick through through a series of conversations we figured out what that was and were able to activate in a way that they're really proud of and they and they care about the issues and want to talk about the issues with fans at the tables and that is what is really exciting to me about what I'm doing with level is creating long-term partnerships about the issues that you're going to care about for your whole life. Wow, that's impressive. And I I learned a lot from what you just told me. And I imagine that folks out there will definitely find that of interest and useful. And um, it's about to be the uh, political typhoon of a presidential election. And I've done my best to kind of stay out of that dialogue in terms of the podcast and on social media and and as you mentioned that can be like a cesspool at times uh but i it's also a really powerful tool and uh, you know how we all communicate with each other and how our work moves at such a rapid pace um so i've been dissolute i mean i remember when andy started headcount in 2004 as a reaction to the iraq war and this sort of then you know draconian george w bush who seems almost mild now but then it was a big deal so big a deal that andy started headcount and here we are three elect presidential election cycles later and with 15 15, yeah 15 years of headcount and it's it's dark times in uh our culture and a lot of people like myself are disillusioned with things it's hard for me to plug into that i'm really politically active on a local level but in the bigger picture i just it's horrifying to me and i've stayed away but what you're telling me now is of interest to me. If I could participate in concert in tandem with my friends and favorite band and also uh, contribute to you know, the bigger movement here, which is uh, voter uh, registration, voter awareness, and mobilization, like that kind of brings me out of the darkness a little bit. So I wanted to say thank you for explaining it that way so that hopefully people out there who are just like fuck voting or fuck the president or you know a lot of us just don't necessarily even believe it's uh, fair you know it's like on the level so how how would you combat that how would you if I were somebody who came up to the table to you and was like you know I don't really want to vote that's some bullshit what do you tell that guy or gal I think that, so the first year that I could vote was in the 2008 elections, um, and I knew I wanted to vote for Obama. That was pretty simple for me. Um, And I voted at the local level just because I should, um, and didn't do that much research as an 18-year-old into the issues. Um, But, you know, you can read the issues on your ballot and kind of decide in the moment how you feel about them and who you're going to vote for. And I was at a pretty surface level with voting when I began, Um, and I think that in the past two years I've seen a collective change in the people that I know saying, okay, we have a local election coming up, we better know what what platforms these people are running on. And it's it's a bit of a conversation piece in the lead up to the elections in November. um, I saw friends on social media and in real life talking about who the who the 
people on the ballot were, what they stood for, and and what they were going to do. And so this was the first time that I had really dove into the ballot before I voted. Um, and my friends and I collaborated um, on a Google Doc, which I use all day long for work, but I'd never really used on a personal level to say, okay, this is the issue, you know, issue X on the ballot. Here's what it's trying to do. Um, something about oil drilling in Colorado. And we kind of all put our thoughts in there and, and we're collaborating on that. And it's interesting. So Lettuce, lettuce has had... Um, has had head count out for a while and, and Deitch actually during this election season in, in November was out on tour and didn't know what he was going to do with his ballot and asked me to come over and we went through the ballot measures, each one of them and then I walked him over to the polling place across the street and he put in his ballot and knew what he was voting on and I think that was a really powerful moment for both him and I to s say okay we're participating in the voting process in a way that's informed and in a way where I can actually use my opinion and the, th the opinions that I have on these things and make a difference. So that is what I would suggest to people to combat voter apathy is dive into the ballot, see what the issues are and how you can vote and use your voice to pick the things that matter to you. That's important to me and um, it was a groundbreaking election for me in that way. I felt more informed this year than ever before and I had a loss of apathy um, and felt really motivated. So. I hope that other people can understand that by diving into these things, you can use your voice and become motivated, talk to your friends, collaborate, take your friends to vote, and we can make a difference. You know, I think we all had a wake-up call, so let's respond to that. Yeah, that's an inspiring story right there, and I'm pleased that you shared it, and I know that it'll reverberate with listeners. Um, so I want to say thanks. You know, we, there's plenty more for us to talk about. Maybe we'll pick it up down the road. I'm grateful that you shared all that, and I wanted to give you the opportunity to let people know how they can find you, reach you, read about Level, all that. Like, what's the best way to get to you online? So you can look us up online. It's www.leveltogether.com or on Instagram at Level Together. We'll see you there. That's great. Well, we definitely will be uh, happy to spread any messages or awareness or projects or endeavors that you know you feel like the listeners need to know about you just let us know and i'll be sure to read them on the air so i'm going to sign off from the park 55 hotel in downtown san francisco with level together uh, own hillary gleason uh, this is b gets the up for life podcast and we'll see you next time Yes, indeedy. I want to say thank you to Miss Hillary Gleason for that lovely interview in the hotel lobby. Did my best to kind of produce the, the episode and the segment without too much noise. There's a lot of moving parts. But she did great, and I thought it was a really enlightening and insightful uh, conversation with somebody out there doing the good work, as they say. And uh, hopefully she can inspire some of y'all out there either to, to get involved with what she's about or to start doing your own thing. Either way, uh, that's inspiring stuff, and, and that's why I'm doing this show. Besides just putting out the vibe, um, I'm trying to inspire people to either overcome adversity or to take what they are doing to another level. And uh, that's what the Upful Life is all about. Period, point blank, bottom line. Now, speaking of vibe, we've reached the end of the episode, which means Vibe Junkie Jam of the Week. It's time. And uh, I gotta split the dap between the homie Randy at Funk It Blog and one of my favorite drummers, John Spies, for putting me onto the Black Pumas, or I should just say Black Pumas. No the. Uh, you're hearing Black Moon Rising in the background, which is a track that John played on in the studio, as I understand. And John uh, Spies, that is, posted that he was going uh, on a quick four or five show run with Black Pumas, fill in for the regular drummer. The connection there being that Adrian Casada from John's uh, other groups, Grupo Fantasma and Brownout, uh, he's a part of Black Pumas, and uh, 
It's described as sort of some ghost face samples meets Motown shit. And, and I think it's a pretty apt description, if I do say so myself. Uh, it's got vibe. We're talking about vibe junkie, man. This the vibe is proper. So John posted he was going on tour. I was like, okay, if Spice is on this and he's like, you know, going to go out and learn, practice six hours and then go out on the road with these cats, they got to be doing something right. Because Spice has his thumb on the pulse of what's really hot in the streets and always has, as long as I've known him or been aware of what he's about. You know, he's, he's like, trust is 100% there. Same with Randy at Funk It Block. So when I commented on John's post that like, yo, this shit is for real, for real. Randy slid in and was like, man, I sent this to you a month ago or something like that, uh, weeks ago. And, you know, he's right. You know, I get inundated with music and sometimes things get by me. And I really didn't dive in until the Spice co-sign. Uh, but I got to give the double dap to Randy at Funk It Blog and John Spice of Bl- uh, Brown Out and Grupo Fantasma and temporarily of Black Pumas for putting me on to the Black Puma thing. And, uh... Uh, Vibe Junkie Jam of the Week coming right up. Colors is the name of the song. You're here in Black Moon Rising, and I'm going to play you a live version of Colors, which is just absolute heat rocks. And uh, it was recorded live in Austin a few weeks ago, Studio 1A, and that's Black Pumas. And you're listening to the Up for Life podcast, episode 20. I'm your host, B. Getz, and we will see you next time.
Get closer, baby. 